We are beginning Galatians chapter 4. We've already heard part of our passage this morning and the assurance of pardon when the time had fully come. A wonderful picture of the gospel in Galatians 4 that we'll look at this morning. Once you've found Galatians 4, please stand if you're able for the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. This is God's word. I mean that an heir, that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Well, so far the reading of God's word. Please pray with me. Father, as our Savior prayed for us, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Show us Christ and his grace in this passage. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, transform us by that grace into people who know you more deeply and follow you more closely day after day. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. You know, my daughter, Piper, she's almost three years old. Uh, she's never gone to school, and she knows the ABCs already. Uh, perks of having an older sister, I guess, who's in homeschool. Uh, Piper can name just about all of the keys on my computer keyboard. She says number O, number J. For some reason, she really loves number J. <laughs> uh, everyone knows the ABCs, basically everyone. The ABCs are the basics. And I think that's a good way to capture uh, one side of what Paul is after in our passage this morning. It's a different kind of ABCs, though. In this case, there's a significantly more uh, sober twist on this idea of the basics. Uh, the ABCs that we all know uh, are, are the way we think the world works. The common knowledge that you'll get what's coming to you. You get what's coming to you, and that's a big problem, isn't it, for sinners uh, looking for rescue. So Christianity answers that big problem with a small word bigger than the whole world, and that word is grace. So two points this morning. Uh, these points are ways for us to think about uh, this problem, this predicament that we're all in, uh, one that was made very clear to Israel when God gave them the law, but a predicament that's shared by Jew and Gentile. Uh, and then on, on the other hand, the solution that God has given for this problem, the rescue he's provided from it. So this problem and this answer in this way, one, the ABCs that everyone knows, the ABCs that everyone knows, and secondly, the spirit of adoption for those known by God. The spirit of adoption for those known by God. So first, look with me at this first point, the ABCs that everyone knows. I want to focus right now on what Paul says in Galatians 4.3, if you would look there with me. Galatians 4.3. When we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. What does Paul mean by that? Well, these elementary principles, these ABCs, are the basic ideas that everyone knows. It's this basic understanding of the way things work, which Paul is referring to, to here in our passage. And it's spelled out by God in the law that he gave to Israel. It's the problem of sin, guilt, and condemnation that the whole world knows, even if people try not to think much about it. 
or to borrow Paul's language from Romans chapter 1, uh, it's knowledge that people know, but they suppress. They suppress it. Our passage this morning is about getting from these ABCs of actions and consequences, uh, getting away from that prison cell that enslaves and condemns, uh, getting away from that to joyfully saying, Abba, in our adoption through Christ. And then in turn, uh, never returning back to the ABCs. So I want to walk through these first few verses at first to get at this. Uh, Paul's expanding here on what he's just um, given to continue his thoughts about the law, if you recall, as a school or a schoolmaster given to Israel, a guardian or a tutor that was temporary and given to take them to Christ, uh, in whom both Jew and Gentile have become together heirs according to the promise by faith. And here Paul gives yet another example, expanding on this idea. Uh, while there's a lot of doctrinal depth in what Paul says in Galatians 3 and 4, at least we can appreciate uh, his use of a good illustration. And this illustration helps to further explain the condition of Israel under the law of Moses. Paul says in verses 1 and 2, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So, uh, think about this um, in your own case. Just as your child, if you have children, might be uh, the legal heir or the legal heirs to your estate, uh, your child doesn't yet possess that inheritance. Someone has put it, the inheritance is held under trust. I think that captures the idea. It belongs to you, but it's not yours yet. A legal heir in this way is no different than an orphan with regard to experiencing an inheritance, at least while the heir is still under age. Or, as Paul says, drawing his illustration from the culture of his day, a son and a slave are basically the same thing until the son is of age and receives an inheritance. The heir, Paul says, though he is the owner of everything, he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So there's a way of being an heir while under age, during childhood, and there's a way of being an heir once becoming an adult. I can't help but quote Alistair Begg here. When the son becomes an adult, he gets a different heir do. I'll be here all morning. He gets a different heir do. There's a different experience of the inheritance. It's it, it's, a, it's, it's the same as being an orphan when you're underage. It's the same as being a slave. You have nothing that you have in your hands, yet it all belongs to you. This was the experience of every individual Israelite who looked by faith to the promise during the days of the law under the Mosaic Covenant. The inheritance had not yet arrived. They did not yet experience it. Paul then explains further in Galatians 4.3, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now this verse, and particularly this phrase, the elementary principles of the world, uh, it needs interpreting in order to actually understand it. Uh, so much so that a lot of preachers just refer to the phrase in Greek, the stoikeia tu kosmu. The stoikeia tu kosmu. But I'm going to stick to this phrase I borrowed from Ritterboss, the ABCs. I like that better, and it's a lot easier to say. But what is it? What are the ABCs that everyone knows? The ABCs under which Israel was enslaved. This, this ABC idea that Paul calls the elementary principles of the world, at least in our translation. Well, the idea is that you get what's coming to you. Actions have consequences. You reap what you sow. Paul is later going to give that idea. You reap what you sow. This wonderful uh, transformation because of the spirit we've received. But here, the idea is the simple rule. You reap what you sow. It's the basic premise of so many of the world's religions, maybe all of them. And it's the idea that grace comes along and turns on its head. Just the other day, I asked Mariana if she thought pretty much everyone believed today that the world basically runs on karma. It basically runs on karma. She said, she thought probably so, and then she opened social media, and the first video that popped up said, man throws a tantrum in the drive-thru and gets instant karma. 
So either they're listening or the idea is so pervasive that it proves the point. Maybe both, <laughs> probably both. Uh, but whether it's doing penance in a religious system the right way or virtue signaling the right cause in the right moment, it all boils down to this basic premise. What I do makes me acceptable. Works righteousness. I do in order to receive. This idea is pervasive, and I think if we see this, or I think we will see this if you look with me down to verse 8. Just a few verses down, uh, we see how the law works, the blessing for obedience and the curses for disobedience that accompanied the law given to national Israel. Uh, this is connected with the very thing that these Gentiles in Galatia were rescued out of, were saved out of. Look with me at verse 8. Paul says, Formerly when you did not know God, and he's referring now not to the Jewish believers, but to the Gentile believers. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? So there is something, even in pagan religions that is an echo however distorted that echo is of what the creator and redeemer of israel spelled out to israel when he gave them the law returning to the law to circumcision to the rituals <clears throat> that were to point forward to christ <clears throat> this would be akin to returning to paganism that's a shocking thing for paul to say it might make some of us uncomfortable it certainly made the Judaizers uncomfortable who were saying that one must return to the law in addition to the good news of Christ's finished work in order to be saved. But Paul's making an important point. And I don't think he's denigrating the law. I think he's upholding the law as that which all of the pagan religions are, are just a mere aping or echo of. However distorted that is, the truth of the law is seen in all of man's religious efforts to obtain the satisfaction of God or of the gods, those who were not gods, yet you were enslaved to them, Paul says. In Israel, this looks like obeying God's commandments or losing the land, right? Out among the nations, among the Gentiles, this looks like observing the right festivals, the days and months and seasons and years, an echo of some of the good things God gave his people, uh, appeasing the gods so that your crops won't, or your crops won't grow or your wives won't bear children, or your enemies will conquer you. You reap what you sow. What's perverted by pagan religions and echoed in today's popular level understanding of the way things work, karma, things like that, is this foundational and basic true principle taught in the law given to Israel. All mankind is bound to obey to receive life, and disobedience brings death. That's what the law taught Israel. And that's what we all know. That's the ABCs that are engraved on our hearts. It's a law that was written on our hearts at creation. It's the broken covenant that plunged Adam and his posterity, all of us, into condemnation and death. The law written on the hearts of human beings, what we call natural law, was spelled out in the law given to Israel through special revelation. It's holy, it's righteous, it's good, it can restrain sin. It can instruct us in our need, but it cannot redeem sinners. It teaches sinners, but it cannot save them. It won't save them. For sinners, it only condemns. And the dim echo of that in the world beyond Israel, and even to the present day, are these elementary principles of the world, these ABCs that you get what's coming to you. You get what's coming to you unless, unless God has provided an answer to this common problem that we share with everyone we've ever met. Unless God has provided the answer. I'll never forget the first time I heard this uh, quote from an interview with Bono. And I'm not going to pretend, I barely know who Bono is. That's the problem with being a missionary kid. I grew up listening to accordion music, and definitely not you too. Um, Paul David Hewson, the Irish singer-songwriter, one of my professors shared this as the interview with that well-known Reformed theologian, Bono. And I turned it up this week again, so I'll share it with you. It gets to the heart of this. The interviewer begins, As I told you, I think I am beginning to understand religion. 
because I have started acting and thinking like a father. What do you make of that? Bono replies, yes, I think that's normal. It's a mind-blowing concept that the God who created the universe might be looking for company, a real relationship with people. But the thing that keeps me on my knees is the difference between grace and karma. There it is again. I haven't heard you talk about that. Well, I really believe we've moved out of the realm of karma and into one of grace. You see, at the center of all religions is the idea of karma. You know, what you put out comes back to you. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Or in physics, in physical laws, every action is met by an equal and opposite one. It's clear to me that karma is at the very heart of the universe. I'm absolutely sure of it. And yet, along comes this idea called grace to upend all that as you reap what you sow, or as you reap so you will sow stuff. Grace defies reason and logic. Love interrupts, if you like, the consequences of your actions, which in my case is very good news indeed, because I've done a lot of stupid stuff. The interviewer says, I'd be interested to hear that. That's between me and God, but I'd be in big trouble if karma was going to be my judge finally. I'd be in deep scubalon, to borrow a word from Paul. It doesn't excuse my mistakes, but I'm holding out for grace. I'm holding out that Jesus took my sins onto the cross because I know who I am and I hope I don't have to depend on my own religiosity. Isn't that good? Does any of that strike a chord with you? Bono says in another place in the interview, I'm not sure I'm the best advertisement for this stuff. I think we can all say amen to that. But there's that little word that's bigger than the world, grace. Under the law, faithful Israel looked for the promise. They put their faith in the promise. They held out for the coming promise. And the ABCs bore down heavy on their sinful hearts every day of their waiting. That's the first point. That's the ABCs that everyone knows. But let's look at the spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption for those known by God. If the ABCs, the elementary principles of the world, taught that man gets what he deserves... The coming of Jesus turns that on its head. Look again with me at Galatians 4, now in verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. In the fullness of time, in the days of the law, God's people were kept like an heir who hadn't received the promise. Faith looked to the promise. It longed for the promise, but it hadn't received the promise. Those in Israel who looked by faith to the promise and through the tutor of the law, they saw the coming promise They were upheld and sustained by grace. But the bigger day of freedom was still coming. Hebrews 11, I'm sure you recall, there's story after story after story of Israel, of individual Israelites holding out by faith, obeying by faith, doing wonderful things by faith. But it ends with this remarkable statement. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So with the coming of Jesus, the predicament of Israel and the problem of all humanity was answered. Your problem answered in Jesus. Here, in what Paul describes to us in Galatians 4, 4 to 7, uh, it, it makes this, it adds another tone or another hue to this beautiful picture of the gospel. The gospel has many different brushstrokes and many different colors in its palette. And this is not the one that we're used to seeing. It's the one we haven't really seen in great detail so far in Galatians. The concept of Jesus' righteousness applied to sinners. Uh, His righteousness credited to us in our justification. Uh, We've used that brushstroke. Paul's gone there. But here, it's it's this new shade of the good news. We're seeing here the work of Christ that brought the promised spirit to us and the experience of adoption as sons. With our adoption, God has sent his spirit into our hearts, and we cry, Abba, Father. This creates a new reality for both Jew and Gentile who by faith look to him. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, 
than an heir through God. Why, why Abba, Father? Why this repetition? And why Aramaic and then Greek? The Aramaic remains Abba in our translation, and Father is the Greek word. Why? Well, Andrew Doss uh, comments on this. I think he points out something really remarkable. He says the Aramaic word may initially seem out of place in a letter in Greek to a Gentile audience. Aramaic was the language of the Jews in the vicinity of their homeland, while Greek was the language of Paul's Gentile audiences. And Paul's doubled address of the Father in both Aramaic, this Jewish language in the vicinity of their homeland, and in Greek, the language of the Gentile Christians, is likely another way of expressing that Jews and Gentiles in Christ now share the same rights as sons in the same family. I think that's great. It's a great observation. Uh, but even beyond the two languages that point to this new reality, this new man in Christ, let's take a moment to just dwell on the fact that in Christ, God is our Father. We address God as our Father. When I was working on this sermon, I was working at home on Thursday of this week, and I hear a knock at the door. I say, yes. I hear, Daddy, I want to get some things to draw. I was in Mariana's office. It's also the schoolroom. Okay, no problem. So someone, com someone comes in and gets papers and rustles around and gets markers and heads on back out the door. A few minutes later, another knock. Right, yes. Daddy, I need puzzle. I need puzzle. So the wonderful thing about being a dad is you have occasions all the time to improve in your sanctification, right? It's built in uh, to the family. But in this moment, I didn't mind. I didn't care. Sure, come in and get some markers. What is that going to hurt? Come in and find your puzzle because I'm your dad. For anyone who's here this morning who has ever feared in your life to knock on your dad's door, which I know there are some here today, the work of Jesus has given you a father that outstrips any human father on earth, no matter how good or bad they were. Again, to quote Andrew Doss, this is, this is wonderful. The divinely enabled address of God as Father will be of comfort to those who have suffered under sinful earthly fathers in his faithfulness to his promises and in his selfless love for his children. The Heavenly Father is the model for all fathers. Those who have suffered enjoy a new family in Christ. The Heavenly Father brought forth children for the purpose of a joyous personal relationship. The pain of broken homes, uncaring parents, and failed relationships all point to the need for a caring parent and ultimately for a sound relationship with the Heavenly Father. The loving Father will heal the wounds, whatever they may be. You see, Israel's experience under the law was not marked by free access knocking on Dad's door. It wasn't a bad relationship, but it was a mediated relationship. Relationship, but at an arm's length. God's presence was mediated through the priests and marked off in progressive layers of holier and holier places ending in the holy place into which the great high, or the high priest could only enter once a year and him alone. This is Sinai laid on its side. The thundering holiness of God on the top of the mountain is in the holy of holies. Distance was the point, but that distance that was in the law gave way to access and welcome in Jesus. And the word redeem here helps us to understand how that happens. To redeem those who were under the law. How did Jesus achieve this new way of relating uh, to God for his people? It's worth giving some attention to. It shows us how slaves under the law can be made sons under the gospel. David Van Drunen, one of my professors, he really helpfully points out that uh, redeem a coupon. If any of you ever redeemed a coupon, maybe you did this week. Or proof of redemption are remnants of the commercial idea of this word. But more to the point, uh, Van Drunen says, one of the ways this was used in the ancient world was to describe a slave being bought out of his slavery. So if Israel under the law had the ABCs and they were in bondage as slaves to the ABCs, and if pagan Gentiles under natural law with the law written on everyone's heart since creation 
we're in bondage to the ABCs. And if you and I share this common problem of all humanity, apart from redemption, bondage and slavery to this elementary principle of the world that you get what's coming to you, and that's bad news because we shouldn't want to get what's coming to us, how do we get out of that mess? What's the good news? God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that you might receive adoption as sons. Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God, was sent to fulfill the ancient promise that Paul has spoken of time and again in his letter to the Galatians. The law which taught Israel under the law concerning uh, the bondage and the, the sin and the death and the condemnation that is due because of sin, uh, the law was added because of transgression, transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. We see here in Galatians 4, 4 to 5, the terms given by the Father and the eternal plan for our salvation, what theologians have called the covenant of redemption, this eternal agreement between the Father and the Son, when the time had fully come. What time? When the Son finally came, taking up the task of redeeming all those who would be given to Him, humiliating Himself, humbling Himself to the point of death, even death on a cross perfect obedience and perfect sacrifice for his own, born as a woman, as a human being, so that he could actually take the punishment that human beings deserve, born under the law, born under the law as this picture that this is the answer for Israel, this is the answer for the world, this is the answer to the elementary principles of the world that we all have written on our hearts. Jesus came to fulfill all of that. The eternal Son of God wasn't born to Cassandra or Ariadne, this is the Jewish Messiah. He was born to Mary in Bethlehem. He's born under Israel's law. That's so important. Because while the, under the Mosaic Covenant, the people of Israel, who looked by faith to the promised Messiah, were waiting for this Messiah to come. This promised one who would come from their people. One who would be raised up from the people. A prophet like Moses. To him you shall listen. Jesus came and fulfilled all of these prophecies contained within the Mosaic Covenant answering the problem of the law, but the substance of grace that was always there finally comes in Jesus. And with the good news of Jesus, when it finally arrives, it changes everything, even for them. Notice this. Under the law, it was a very different way of relating to God. It was faith in a promise, but the promise had not come. One theologian, your heart is Voss, he put it this way. The new covenant what's come in Jesus, is so superior as to even have a retroactive power extending back to the first covenant. The perfecting effected by Christ is carried back to the Old Testament believers. Thus, a retroactive effect is ascribed to the work of Christ. These Old Testament believers were not affected, they didn't experience this, we could say, until Christ actually entered upon his sacrifice. They waited through the ages for this. And finally, Christ has come, and they have received the promise along with us by faith. Here's the bottom line. If you put your faith in Jesus, you won't get what you deserve. It's as simple as that. The ABCs are what everyone knows, but those who put their faith in Jesus receive the adoption, the spirit of adoption. They are known by God. Did you catch that in verse 9? One of the greatest phrases in the Bible. Now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God. To be known by God. What better news could there possibly be than that? To be known by God, which is synonymous with saying to be loved by God. To be loved by God. Why would we ever, Gentile Christians being tempted by the Judaizers to return to circumcision, we who are sometimes tempted to take on the works righteousness that's just the spirit of the age we breathe? Why would we go back to the ABCs when we've been known by God and set free from that slavery? We can, we can obey the law all we want. We should, out of gratitude. It's the way of the good life. It's the way to please God, the way to give thanks to God for what he's done for us. But we should never return to that as a way of approaching God or we've completely abandoned the one in whom we are saved and the one in whom we are known by God. 
So let's never go back to the ABCs. Let's continue to cry out, Abba, Father. Please pray with me. Father, Father, and we don't say that lightly, but with great joy and gratitude because of Jesus, our Father in heaven, help us to grasp the grace that has come in your perfect time. The eternal Son of God stepping into our problem, getting what we deserve so that in Him we can get what we don't deserve an inheritance of grace, of being known and thus loved by God, receiving the spirit of adoption. Teach us to live as sons and not as slaves, heirs who have come into the joy of our inheritance in Jesus, the fullness of which is reserved just for a little while, but sealed to us by that spirit that you have given us. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.